Let's face it, in our busy lives, we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. In fact, according to the CDC, only 1 in 10 Americans are eating the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables each day, missing out on essential vitamins, minerals, fibers, and antioxidants. And that's where Balance in Nature comes in. Balance in Nature sources only the best produce, free from pesticides, heavy metals, and harmful bacteria. And Balance in Nature is the best fruit and vegetable product on the market. They use only fresh whole fruits and vegetables inside each capsule. They don't use any GMOs, fillers, binding agents, or preservatives of any kind. You're getting real food, real science, real nutrition. I would never endorse a product that I don't use myself, and since using Balance in Nature, I feel more alert, I have more energy, my focus is sharper, and I feel great. Live life to the fullest and choose Balance in Nature. And guess what? PAS Report listeners can get 35% off the first preferred order. Start getting the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables you need by using code PAS at balanceofnature.com. Welcome to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. The PAS Report provides an honest analysis on the critical issues that matter to you without the biased media filter. Here's your host, Professor Nicholas Giordano. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Nick Giordano. Another great episode coming your way, and it's going to be a very important episode because we need to explore what it really means to be free. We're constantly talking about freedom and liberty. We constantly talk about free societies. We preach about Western values. We constantly try to impose these concepts on other countries throughout the world, criticize authoritarianism. But we have to ask ourselves, are we really a free people? We never stop and think about what real freedom and true liberty actually mean. We'll preach about democracy, and we equate democracy and voting to freedom, But no one ever really explains how democracies don't inherently equate to free societies and that the Western world is anything but free, including here in the United States. We have been programmed to think we know what it means to live in a free society and that we exercise liberty and freedom. That's what I want to talk about in this episode. I want to explain how once free societies like ours have become nothing more than authoritarian-run democracies. I want to explore how we've gotten to this point. I want to call out the phonies and the hypocrites. I want to explain what it means to have true liberty. See, we've deviated far from the vision of the Founding Fathers, and we have this warped view of the elements that create a free society. Too many of us have our heads buried in the sand. We go about our daily lives as if everything that we're witnessing is normal. We ignore the increasing authoritarianism creeping into Western society. I don't even know if it's creeping in anymore. It's like a blizzard out there. And we see it on a daily basis. People in these free societies are also the problem because they unknowingly advocate against their own interests, granting the government more power and authority over their lives. It doesn't mean that people want to see authoritarianism. They don't want to see their liberties erode. But until the masses realize what's happening, we're not going to be able to reverse the trend. And before you know it, it's going to be too late. This is why it doesn't matter what your political ideology is. It doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum, because in an authoritarian society, we all get screwed. It doesn't matter if you're progressive, a Democrat, Republican, a conservative. If you want to talk about equity, we will share in the equitable distribution of misery and suffering. Now, before I get into it all, make sure that you click follow on this podcast so that you never miss an episode. Also, be sure to visit the PAS Report website, pasreport.com. There you can check out the show notes, link to any of my sources. I'm also building out an affiliate page uh, of merchants that I'm working with to offer you great discounts. Once it's up and running, I'll let you know. But getting to this episode, when we explore the ideas of freedom and liberty, I want to play a sound clip for you. If you're a conservative, I have little doubt you've definitely heard this sound clip before. If you're on the other side of the political spectrum, you may have heard it before. But regardless of whether you've heard it or not, it's a good time to reacquaint ourselves with this sound clip. I want you to take a listen. And while you're listening to it, I want you to think about where we are as a society today. I want you to think about everything that has gone on over the last 20 years, especially the last few years. Take a listen. Our founding fathers here in this country brought about the only true revolution that has ever taken place in man's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another set of rulers. But only here did that little band of men so advanced beyond their time that the world has never seen their like since evolve the idea that you and I have within ourselves the God-given right and the ability to determine our own destiny. 
But freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. What a clip. And when you listen to it, you realize how right Reagan was. Freedom is precious. And it could be lost so quickly, and we've seen it happen. We've seen it happen throughout history. It's so much easier for a free society to slip into an authoritarian society than it is for an authoritarian society to become free. The process is quick. It doesn't take long. And the interesting thing about what Reagan said was that we didn't inherit our freedom and liberties in our bloodstream. That our founding fathers, giants among men, believed these all-important concepts, while they are inherent with us, that we have these God-given liberties. No one has the ability that no government should deny us from exercising these God-given rights, especially governments. Our founding fathers understood the mindset of human beings. They recognized that liberty is a natural condition of human beings, where we get to exercise our free will responsibly, as long as we're doing it in accord with the dictates of right reason and natural law, and as long as we aren't imposing on other people's liberties. They understood that freedom was the ability to exercise these liberties. See, that's the difference. Liberty, the natural condition of human beings where we exercise our free will responsibly. Freedom is the ability to exercise these liberties. That we should be able to exercise these liberties without fear of reprisals, without threats of canceling, or having our lives destroyed because some bureaucratic pencil neck or a group of ideologues doesn't like what you believe or what you say. And while the Founding Fathers did believe that liberty was the natural condition of human beings, our Founders also acknowledged the flaws of human beings. They understood that human beings would be willing to give up their liberties for stability and security. They understood, and history is replete with examples, of human beings accepting despotism. They live under authoritarian abuses because it's easier to do nothing than it is to show courage and actually push back. And nowhere is this more clearly defined and stated than in our Declaration of Independence, where it says... Quote, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. You know, I, I've had Godsad, Dr. Godsad, on this podcast a bunch of times. He's the author of The Parasitic Mind, brilliant man, and he's hysterical. And he says cowardice should be the eighth deadly sin because ultimately cowardice is just as destructive as the brutality of many authoritarian regimes. It is cowardice that is destroying free societies. The fact is that I cannot imagine most people support the insanity we are witnessing today. I can guarantee most people don't want this gender ideology BS being pushed on children as young as four years old. I could guarantee that most parents don't support their children being messed up for nearly two years, having school shut down. And while some fought back and spoke up against this, most parents did remain silent. That's cowardice. When you think about it, when you look at what parents complain about to schools, they complain about the most asinine things, yet many remain silent when their children were suffering in isolation under distance education, which wasn't really education, when their children were forced to mask up, socially distance from each other. For nearly two years, that took place. As a matter of fact, we complain about a lot of things when you actually think about it when it comes to government. We'll complain when our roads have craters in them and are barely drivable, and I understand that. I do that all the time. My roads are horrendous here in New York. We complain when we get called for jury duty, like our government's asking so much of us. They're asking us to sit on a jury. That's not really that much, and yet we'll still complain about it. We'll complain when our taxes go up, but we'll still pay them. We'll complain that Congress isn't passing any legislation. More on that later. We'll complain that government isn't doing its job. Well, what's government supposed to be doing? Anyone ever actually ask themselves that question? Because when we say government's not doing its job, maybe that's part of our problem today is that we think government exists to do anything and everything for us. How many people complained about the 2020 elections? And for, for those of you that did complain, and I understand the complaints, I'm one of them. How many of those complaining have signed up to become poll workers, to become precinct captains, or tried to volunteer for various positions within the board of election, their local board of elections. My point is that we complain a lot, 
And we don't do much when it comes to doing something about it. Free societies require we participate. And when people don't participate in the system, the government and a fringe minority get to do whatever they want. This is a major part of the problem. As these ideologues have infiltrated every single aspect within our society, particularly government institutions, the officials are nothing more than ideologues. They have destroyed it. Our scope of participation in this country is 100%. 100% of the people can participate in the system. Well, how is that possible? You have to be over the age of 18. Well, no, you have to be over the age of 18 to actually go out and vote. But the reality is that even if you're not 18, you could still participate in the political system. And when you look at our depth of participation, so the scope of participation is 100%. The depth of participation is far lower than that, far lower than that. If we factor in all the different ways we can participate in the system besides voting, it's probably in the low 20 percentile. See, we've been conditioned to believe that just because we get to exercise our right to vote, that that means we are free people living in a free society. You know who else could vote? The Iranian people. They, they could go out there and vote. Are we really going to sit there and say that Iran is a free society? No, of course not. Because voting doesn't signify a free society. And even if we do, let's just say hypothetically, that if we say that if you vote, you're doing your part and you're participating in the system, even when it comes to voting, we feel miserably at that too. And all you need to do is look at the numbers. Only 10 to 25% of the voter eligible population will actually turn out to vote in local elections. I mean, that is horrifically pathetic, especially given that the local government impacts our lives much more than the federal government does. When it's a state race, voter participation is anywhere from 30 to 55 percent. It all depends if a governor is running for office. If it's a governor's race, it's going to be closer to the 55 percentile. If there isn't a gubernatorial race going on, the participation drops dramatically. When it comes to a presidential race, voter turnout is anywhere from 47 percent to 58 percent. Again, that's pathetic. It means that nearly half of those eligible to vote don't even come out to vote. So while we've been conditioned to believe that we're free just because we have the right to vote, and that's what makes us a free society, we don't even exercise the one thing that we've been conditioned to believe. That's the amazing part. And I can't imagine that 50% of the country is satisfied with the way things are going. In fact, I know that's not true, because when you look at the right track, wrong track poll, 80 plus percent of Americans believe we are headed on the wrong track. That's 80 plus percent. And guess what? Half of that 80 plus percent that's unsatisfied, that don't like the way things are going, half of them are not going to go out and vote in the next election. Truly stunning. We've also been conditioned to believe that just because we call something a democracy, that democracy and freedom are the same. That just because we call something a democracy, that that means we live in a free society, even though they are two very different things. And we aren't even a democracy on top of that. Fact that I didn't, but God forbid we actually teach that, but we don't. We've been conditioned to believe that majorities can't be tyrannical, when in fact the opposite is true. Just look at history. Again, democracies can be brutal at times. And just because you may live in a democracy, it doesn't mean that democracies can't be tools of injustices. Yet, it's funny. It's funny to watch the public virtue signalers constantly preach about democracy, and at the same time, they criticize the same system as inherently evil and racist. You would think that they would realize that, but they don't, of course. It goes over their heads just like everything else. But the reason I decided to do this episode was because of a disturbing video I saw. This wasn't a video from the United States. It's a video from Britain. But we have to ask ourselves, how long before it gets imported here? Now, I'm going to play the clip. I want you to take a listen, and then I'm going to explain what happened. The Swedish Hampshire police would realise how ridiculous this is. It is ridiculous. It is. Well, what did it need to come to? Tell, tell what, us why you escalated it to this level. Because I don't understand. I posted something that he posted. You come to arrest me, you don't arrest him. Why has it come to this? Why am I in cuffs? Because of something he shared, then I shared. Because someone has been caused, obviously, anxiety based upon your social media post. Not okay, so here you have a man that reposted something on social media that caused another person to have anxiety. For that offense, for that offense, the man was arrested. For some of you, the first question you may be asking is, what did he post that got him arrested? But that's the wrong question. It's part of our problem. By asking that question first, it highlights how we've gotten to this point. See, by asking what he posted... 
you are unknowingly validating the idea that someone can and should be arrested over certain social media posts. So you see the flaw by asking that question first. Unless the person was openly threatening violence against someone else, people, group of people, businesses, government, unless he was openly threatened violence, it shouldn't matter what he posted. More importantly, it shouldn't matter that his post caused anxiety. Hurt feelings don't constitute crimes. And if hurt feelings is, start, is going to start to become criminal, we've got a big problem. Not just in this country, but in the Western world. If anxiety is the new metric, if we're really going to go and buy that metric and say, if someone causes you anxiety, they could be arrested. Well, then can we arrest the little Mussolini wannabe Lord Fauci? Because every time he opens his mouth, he gives me anxiety. Or what about the unelected governor of New York, Empress Hochul, the tyrant that she is? She gives me a lot of anxiety. So can we arrest her then if this is the new standard we're going to go by? And if this is the new standard that we're going to go by, then I'm in a lot of trouble. I'm screwed because every semester when I give exams and research papers to do, many of my students, they're going to get anxiety. So I'm going to get like 250 plus complaints each and every semester. The whole thing is ridiculous. Here's the problem. First, it's a direct assault on freedom of speech and freedom of thought. Secondly, it is the main reason that we are creating an entire generation of self-entitled spoiled brats who are unable to function in society and they need to be sheltered from every little damn thing. I hate to break it to all the soft people out there, but anxiety is a part of life. Disagreements are a part of life, and when someone disagrees with you and you get offended or anxious, that problem is on you, not the other person. That's your problem. I routinely talk to people from the left wing, and while some espouse communist and Marxist sentiments, I don't get anxious over it. I don't sit there and say, you're offending me. They have every right to believe whatever the hell they want. I may challenge them on it, but I'll always defend their right to freedom of speech and freedom of thought. And getting back to this incident, the much more frightening aspect of the story, it turned out the guy retweeted images of the pride flag in the shape of a SWAT sticker. He said he retweeted the meme to serve as a commentary on the authoritarian nature of transgender activists, which can be very authoritarian. Let's not deny that. Now, I am not someone who likes the Nazi comparisons. I always think Nazi comparisons are, are just stupid, right? I mean, the second you use Nazi comparisons when you're talking about social issues, you end up discrediting yourself. Nazi references, what the Nazis did was so horrific that you want to limit the type of Nazi references you make because you don't want to diminish the Holocaust and what took place during the Holocaust. Nazi references should only be used in the most extreme of circumstances. So if you're talking about communist China and their treatment of the Uyghurs and the Christians, Nazi reference may make sense. If you're talking about the transgender activist community, no, I'm not going to call them Nazis. They may be radicals, but they're not Nazis, that's for sure. But what's more frightening is that this was the second visit to the man's home. See, the first time they went to the man's home, the police offered him a deal that he could pay a fine and take an educational course instead of the complaint escalating to the level of a crime. Because that's not Orwellian or anything. You need to be re-educated. See, this man deviated from a narrative. And some bureaucratic pencil neck determined that his opinion isn't the right opinion and therefore... He should either be re-educated so that he never deviates from the accepted narrated narrative again or face arrest. Does that really sound like a free society to you? And while we may not be as extreme here in the United States, at least right now, how long before it does get that extreme? I mean, this type of stuff is prevalent throughout Europe, yet we still pretend that European countries are free. And they're not. Just look at the farmers in several European countries where their lives and livelihoods are going to be destroyed over the next few years. And for what? For what purpose? All because these people are beholden to a green energy agenda? If we look at our own backyard, just look at Canada, where you have that pathetic tyrant, Justin Blackface Trudeau. He made it his mission to destroy the lives of those who took part in the trucker protests. He went after any business that expressed any type of support for the truckers. He went after any individual that donated money to the cause. I mean, you want to talk about petty tyrants. Trudeau is the most pathetic of the bunch. He epitomizes what a petty tyrant really is. But even here in America, we have been witnessing a trampling of our rights for the last 20 years. And it picked up a lot of steam over the last few years. Looking at the obvious, you could see the clear coordination between the government and big tech oligarchs that censored millions of Americans. And why did they do it? Did they really do it for misinformation and disinformation? Well, the answer is no. 
And we know that for a fact, right? Because they never labeled anyone that was pushing the false Russian collusion narrative as spreading misinformation and disinformation. They never labeled anyone saying that Hunter Biden's laptop was Russian disinformation. They didn't label that misinformation, disinformation. So we know that people are being censored in order to control a narrative and end debate on a variety of topics. This is not some wild conspiracy theory. This is something that has been openly admitted to. The former press secretary, Jen Psaki, openly admitted that the White House was flagging posts for what they deem as offensive, misinformation, and disinformation. And of course, only one side gets to determine what's misinformation and disinformation. So you need to know how that works. I mean, right? See, anything you say could be misinformation and disinformation, but the powers that be, well, when they're putting their crap out there, that can't be misinformation, disinformation. You know, like Biden's pledge, he's not going to raise taxes on those making under $400,000. That was surely misinformation, disinformation, as we're witnessing with the quote-unquote Inflation Reduction Act. I'll get to that later, too. Or how's about if you get the vaccine, you can't get COVID? I mean, that was certainly misinformation and disinformation that existed. So only one side gets to determine what's misinformation and disinformation. That's why it's so flawed. We are witnessing the implementation of speech controls throughout our society. And what you can and cannot say will be determined by the powers that be. Just look at certain topics. Look at how restricted they are. Look at how you have to be so careful because, God forbid, it's taken out of context. If it's taken out of context and nobody understands sarcasm anymore, I mean... What happened to people that, that they don't understand humor or sarcasm or anything anymore? But if you're taken out of context, there are some of these losers that have nothing better to do with their lives. That, that's the God honest truth. And they want to destroy your life. These are the same losers that will sit there and, you know, take off Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben and the, the cream of weak eye. You notice how all the minority people have been taken off the store shelves. And yet the Quaker Oats guy... He's still there. The Farina boy, he's still there. Interesting how that worked out, huh? And did it solve this problem of white supremacy? I don't think so. They're fools. That's what they are. And then you have the FBI, who actually plays into this. They're, they're a part of this. I mean, you look at the FBI, it, it really is stunning that this once well-respected institution, well-respected, and it was so well-respected that there was so many people that didn't call for that much oversight over it, that, that they did and bent over backwards any which way they can in Congress to help the FBI by providing more funding and more resources. But this is one corrupt institution. We are now learning of an internal FBI memo that was leaked to Project Veritas by a whistleblower. And the FBI talks about symbols of potential domestic terrorists. Now, you know that I've been harping on this idea of domestic terrorism for a while. I do believe there are domestic terrorists out there, and I do believe that our government should be looking for those domestic terrorists to actually prevent any type of terror attack happening here in the United States. But the reality is that they're not looking for those domestic terrorists. And I brought up the National Strategy for Countering Domestic Terrorism over a year ago. I've harped on this document time and time again to show that what this document does, it goes far beyond looking for domestic terrorism. And what it does is it tries to paint political opposition as domestic terrorists. So now we get this FBI memo that says symbols. They're going to look at domestic terrorist symbols. And so what are these symbols that could lead to domestic terrorism? Well, they include the Gadsden flag, the don't tread on me flag. It includes the Betsy Ross flag. I mean, this is now, I, uh, like, it, it's silly season out there. Like, can we just say that this whole thing's completely ridiculous now and just end it? You're now saying that the Betsy Ross flag has become a symbol of white supremacy and domestic terrorism? And ironically, of course, these idiots don't understand the irony when it, it hits them in the face, but the FBI has 10 flags on their headquarters. You know, the main American flag in the middle, and then they have varying American flags, and one of those flags is the Betsy Ross flag that's hanging on FBI headquarters. And yet the FBI is now saying that the Betsy Ross flag has become a symbol of domestic terrorists. They don't even think before they put this crap out there. It shows how it's all ideological. It shows how far we are moving towards speech controls. I mean, that, let's just be honest here. Let's call, call it how it is. It's nothing more than speech controls. 
we will determine what you could do to express your patriotism. You know, I routinely talk about the concept of nationalism. I explain the good and the bad to my classes. I highlight its importance. I explain how some have used nationalism in the past for nefarious purposes like Hitler. However, the importance of nationalism cannot be understated. In the last 20 or 25 years, there are some people out there that have attempted to make nationalism a racist concept. They want to take it away. Nationalism was built on the nation-state concept. They want to take it from the nation-state and make it as if nationalism is about race, which it's not. It's not about race or ethnicity. There may be certain things that link people together within the nation-state, but nationalism is about the nation-state itself. And they say that if you believe in nationalism, you're xenophobic. You're expressing ethnocentric tendencies. These, these people believe that they're the smartest people in the room, but really they're the dumbest. So a few of them tell me that I shouldn't talk about the good aspects of nationalism because nationalism has morphed. It's now a bad concept. And if I sit there and I tell my class about the good aspects of nationalism, I'm putting in my, myself in a position where I'm promoting something bad. And they said, instead, use the term patriotism. And I push back against this. I push back against this because I have something, a little something called common sense. It's not that difficult to understand. I explained, you can't just redefine words to satisfy the left. I mean, you just can't do that. You don't redefine what things mean. We have the terms xenophobic and ethnocentric for a reason. They're, they're different meanings. We have the term nationalism for a reason. And I explained. That if we start to redefine words, if we start to redefine something as simple as nationalism, how long before they try to redefine patriotism? As a matter of fact, this was the topic discussed during my first appearance on Tucker Carlson's show. And look at where we are now. Patriotism and patriotic symbols and sentiments, including our current flag, including the current American flag, are now considered to be part of some domestic terrorism nexus. That they're offensive. They hurt feelings. They're symbols of oppression. That those expressing patriotism may be susceptible to becoming domestic violent extremists. How ridiculous is this? And you want to talk about a free society? You thought as parents that you had a stake in your child's education, that you had a say in what should and shouldn't be taught to your child. But as we've witnessed, as we've witnessed, we now see the Department of Justice view ordinary parents as potential threats. We are now witnessing parents get labeled as racist and xenophobic and bigoted, even potential domestic terrorists, because they don't want CRT in the classroom. They don't want their kids to be messed up for six to eight hours a day, but they're the ones that are anti-science, right? They don't want this transgender crap being pushed on their young children. So look at how we treat the parents out there, and we want to say we live in a free society? Look at freedom of the press. That's been under assault for years. Consider how the government has routinely monitored journalists over the last four administrations. Consider how you have this coordinated effort to deplatform media outlets that don't fall in line and tout the mainstream media's narrative. Consider how so many within the field of journalism have openly called for cable providers to drop any conservative outlets. So you're not allowed to hear varying points of view. It's not enough that the left controls 90% of our messaging in the media and regularly coordinates with the politicians and their minions. They want total control. 90% is not enough. We have to give them 100%. And this is what happens when journalists morph into political activists and the lines between media outlets and the government merge into one. You even have officials within the government, the government of the United States of America calling for outlets like Fox News to have their broadcasting license revoked. Last I checked, that's not supposed to happen in a free society. It's something that you see in authoritarian countries. It's something that you see in third world dictatorships, but it's not something you're supposed to see in free societies. We see the whole freedom of religion thing go out the window, right? Remember the government, not supposed to make any laws concerning the establishment of a religion, yet in the name of a crisis, and constantly under state of crisis, the government was the one who determined when, where, and how you could practice your faith. We saw the idea of freedom of petitioning government for redress or the idea of freedom to assembly being challenged, right? That, that got thrown out the window over the last few years. Remember, now, now it matters what you're protesting. And that's how they're going to determine whether or not the protest is legitimate or not. Remember how those that protested lockdowns and unconstitutional mandates were labeled as pushing white nationalist ideology by over 1,300 public health officials who should not have a job today. 1,300 of them. See, only public health officials get to determine what legitimate forms and topics of protest can be. And if you protest against their power, 
they'll attempt to attach the vitalist labels to you. You see how that works? Talk about freedom. You want to talk about living in a free society. We still have soldiers being discharged from the military, police, fire, EMS officers, public health employees, others, all getting fired because they dared to challenge the unconstitutional decree of the shot. A shot that does nothing to prevent the spread and transmission of the coronavirus. A shot that has proven to be an abysmal failure. Yes, it may reduce symptoms, may prevent complications, but let's stop calling it a vaccine, because a vaccine it is not. But if you disobey the ruling authority, the ruling authority will destroy your livelihood. Again, this is what they do in authoritarian countries, not free societies. And we're not the only country that did this. We're not the only country that destroyed our liberties and our freedoms. But you have to understand, we don't have free societies when you're not free to go to work and make a living to provide for your families all because you didn't comply with a mandate issued by power-hungry officials. But we're going to say we're free. We'll, we'll keep on saying we'll free. We'll keep pretending because you get to vote for your elected representatives. And so that means that you are free. You live in a quote-unquote democracy, right? Because we elect our representatives. Even though these elected representatives routinely get bypassed through executive decrees. How's that for a free society? We elect legislative bodies to pass laws, but it turns out that whenever they don't do what an executive wants, the executive will just do what they want anyway. Last I checked, that's not a free society, that's authoritarianism. And look at how many people advocated. Of course, they only advocated if the chief executive belongs to the same political party as they do. But if you look at the congressional approval ratings, it's abysmal. It's something like 15% of the American people approve of Congress, and it's usually that low because Congress is pathetic. But when you ask the people why they disapprove of Congress, the number one answer they give is because they don't do anything. Well, maybe we need to stop looking at Congress as if they're supposed to make law after law after law. Maybe we should look towards Congress to engage in debate and dialogue on the issues. Maybe we should look at Congress to act as a co-equal branch of government. Maybe we should look at Congress and force Congress to use their power of oversight, not for partisan political gain, but to rein in the bureaucratic institutions that have become thoroughly corrupt. I could guarantee that most people listening to this podcast don't want this current Congress to pass laws. Just look at the disaster of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act that just passed. Not really that good. I'm, I'm tired of hearing people complain that Congress is obstructionist. That, that's what Congress exists for, right? They, they're not there to just rubber stamp a president's agenda. You do realize that Congress is supposed to obstruct the president. State legislative bodies exist to obstruct the governors. They're supposed to be co-equal branches of government. And the chief executive doesn't get to do whatever the hell they want. But it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter. Why? Because they do get to do what they want. And then you have these prosecutors, the district attorneys, determining what laws they're going to choose to prosecute and which ones they won't. I mean, who the hell gave these people the authority to determine what laws are righteous and just and which ones aren't? Again, we have legislative bodies for a reason. DAs exist to prosecute the laws that are on the books. Those who violate those laws, that's who gets prosecuted. Their feelings and emotions on particular issues is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. We don't elect them to pontificate on how they feel about a law. We elect them to enforce the laws. And it's not just with the DAs. We have a whole host of government bureaucrats, like Lord Fauci, that think they could do whatever the hell they want. Consequences be damned. It doesn't matter about the legislative bodies. It doesn't matter about checks and balances. When you have unelected bureaucrats making consequential decisions over our lives and the lives of our family members, does that sound like a free society to you? But they get away with it. They get away with it because, God forbid, we hold anyone accountable. Oh, it's an emergency. It's an emergency. It's a crisis. There's a pandemic. There's a war. There's a conflict. There's inflation. There's a recession. There's a depression. I mean, when isn't there a crisis? There's always going to be a crisis. It doesn't mean that you throw the concepts of liberty and freedom away in a crisis. That's the whole thing that our founding fathers were fighting for. It's the whole point that is codified in the Bill of Rights. The Constitution just doesn't disappear because times are tough. And yet that's exactly what we've done. And not a single person gets held accountable. And then you have this... Inflation Reduction Act. You want to think about living in a free society. Well, do you think that the Inflation Reduction Act is going to make you more free or less free? And the answer is obvious, given that laws, by their very nature, are designed to restrict human behavior. 
to establish rules and regulations. It doesn't mean that we don't need laws. But when you say the government exists to pass laws, you get laws like this, you get bad laws. And even worse, in the process, you're giving up some of your liberties, regardless of whether or not you even know that. Now let's look at the Inflation Reduction Act. It sounds great, right? I mean, who wouldn't want to lower inflation? But when you look at the bill, does it do anything to lower inflation? The answer is no, it doesn't. And that's not Professor Giordano's take on it. That's even the Congressional Budget Office's interpretation. That's even the Democrat interpretation of this. Even Bernie Sanders has acknowledged that this bill doesn't do a damn thing to reduce inflation. And the whole thing is being pushed as if it does something to help the American family, but it doesn't. It does the exact opposite. It's actually going to make your life more difficult. This bill claims to reduce the deficit. Oh, it, it, it's deficit reducing. The Congressional Budget Office says that this bill will reduce the deficit by $300 billion. Well, it doesn't do that either. First of all, I'm so tired of politicians that have spent us into oblivion in recent years, well, recent decades, now saying that they are reducing the deficit. It's one of the dumbest talking points I've ever heard. It's like the Biden administration coming out saying, hey, I reduced the price of gas by 50 cents over the last month. When they were the ones that caused the price increases in the first place. It's completely ridiculous. You didn't reduce the price of gas. So now gas prices are up $2 a gallon since you took office instead of two fifty a gallon since you took office. Get gas back to where it was at and then I'll give you credit. Get it lower than it's at and I'll praise you. You know, President Biden trying to take credit for low gas prices is laughable. And it's like, that's the Twilight Zone world that we're living in. The same thing holds true with the whole deficit reduction, like it's a fraud. If I go out there and I spend $2,000 on a vacation in one month, I can't sit there and claim I cut my expenses down by $2,000 the next month because I didn't take a vacation. We've spent ourselves into oblivion. And not for nothing, but the Congressional Budget Office says it's going to reduce our deficit by $300 billion. Yeah, okay. Okay, I want someone out there to show me when has a CBO estimate ever been correct? Like, I'm serious about that. When has it ever been spot on? You never hear of a government program coming in at either what it was estimated to cost or even under budget. It just doesn't happen. It always costs more than the initial budget estimates. And they also didn't take other things into account, but I'm not going to get into that here. Also, they say that this bill, it's going to make wealthy corporations and the elite pay their fair share. They have to pay their fair share because they didn't build it. But that's a lie, too. Sure, it's going to implement new taxes on these corporations. It's going to implement new taxes on the wealthy elite. Well, on the corporations, I'm sure those taxes will probably be passed down to us. You could be sure of that. But the elite and the corporations won't really be paying more. Are you that naive that you would actually believe that? See, here's the thing. If you really wanted the elite and the corporations to pay their fair share, you know, you'd get rid of the deductions, the subsidies, the loopholes. That's what you would do. Then they'd pay taxes. But you could raise their tax rates up. That's fine. You raise their taxes. If the same deductions exist, they're going to be paying the same thing they paid last year, $0, because they're going to have the same write-offs. This is how dumb people are that they buy into this crap. So if we want people to pay their fair share, get rid of subsidies, get rid of deductions, implement a flat, a flat tax across the board. That's what you would do. And we have this idea that we live in a free country, a capitalist economy, right? We have a free market. That's what we're constantly preaching. But we don't have a free market because what happens when the government manipulates every aspect of the economy? What happens when they determine what businesses are essential and which ones aren't? Rather than let the marketplace figure things out, this disaster of a bill pushes a clear agenda. Take the pharmaceutical companies. Now, I have no love for big pharma, especially after, especially after the last couple of years. No love for big pharma. But when you look at this bill, the pharmaceutical companies have to accept government price controls. Oh, Professor Giordano, you're lying. The bill clearly states that these companies get to make a choice. You're being dishonest with your audience. Well, if you don't believe me, just read the damn thing yourself. The pharmaceutical companies, they do have a choice. They can either accept the government price controls or their tax rate jumps to 95%. Wow, that's some choice there, right? We're going to tax you into oblivion or you accept our price controls. You either do what we say or we're going to tax you out of business. See, where I'm from, we call that extortion, right? If you, if you try doing that on the streets of New York, you're either going to get yourself beat up or you're going to get arrested for trying to extort someone. But when government does it, it's legal extortion. And this right here represents that we're not really as free as we think we are. We're not really as, uh, as much of a capitalist 
economy as you think we are. And the bill also adds a new tax for any oil and gas imports. Geniuses that they are at a time. Where gas prices, yes, they've gone down over the last few weeks, I'll admit that. But at a time where gas prices are still at their near all-time highs, they want to tax oil and gas imports. Now, these taxes may not be as draconian as Big Farmer. I think it's something like 18 cents on a barrel of oil coming in from foreign countries. But I will guarantee you that sooner or later, they will use the same extortion tactics towards this industry as they're doing with the pharmaceutical industry. But I want you to think about something even more important for a second. A few years ago, we became an energy exporter. An energy exporter. Since this administration has taken over, we have become an energy importer because they want to push an energy strategy that's not ready for prime time. And guess who suffers in the process? We do. See, we say we live in a free society, but they want to force us to purchase cars that we may not want or can't afford or maybe a combination of both. They don't want us to make the decision. They want to make it as painful as a process as they can so that we're forced to buy these vehicles. That's what it comes down to. Make it so expensive for us that we can't afford these vehicles. That it would make more sense to get the electric vehicles. Make it so expensive for the oil and gas companies to operate. Make it difficult for them to cut through the regulations. Make it impossible for them to turn a profit. Get the banks to stop lending them money. And eventually, you put the oil and gas industry out of business. Does anyone not see that playbook happening right now? Not only that, but the tax is also linked to inflation. So as inflation increases, so does the tax, which causes more pain. That doesn't really sound like a free society to me. That doesn't sound like a capitalist economy to me. We also see tax increases on natural gas to heat your home. We see them on the coal-fired plant power plants. They claim that it's going to reduce our dependency on foreign oil. And this is, I don't know if it's the brilliance of these politicians, that how they try and go out there and attempt to manipulate and sell to the people, or it's our stupidity. This is going to reduce our dependency on these nefarious nations that are providing us with this foreign oil, right? But what they don't tell you is that it's going to increase our dependency on China. I know, right? The beacon. The, the beacon of humanity. The beacon of freedom and democracy. China. They want to push people toward the electric vehicles. Well, who makes the batteries for those vehicles? Understand that 90% of the batteries made for electric vehicles are produced by communist China. So great. We're going to reduce our dependency on foreign oil, even though we could be energy independent here in the United States. That's irrelevant. Don't talk common sense. Don't bring that up here. Not a lot to talk about that. So we're going to reduce our dependency on foreign oil only to transfer this dependency from a few nefarious countries to one of the most nefarious countries, to America's biggest adversary. Then you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, and the bill also wreaks havoc on retirement plans, 401ks, IRAs, deferred comps. Any plan you could think of, retirement plan, because what did they do? Well, we're now going to add a tax to stock buyback. So companies cannot buy back stocks without this tax being implemented. So it doesn't make sense, right? And, you know, you're not going to make as much money now. So these types of buybacks, which help grow the value of the investment accounts of our retirement accounts, well, not anymore. And these are just a few small examples of how we continue to lie to ourselves, believing that we live in a free market system. And it's not just in the economy, though. Free societies, they encourage their people to explore, to study, to invent, to solve problems. However, our government has figured out that it can move the needle and manipulate issues by provide, providing grant funding for things. Our government uses taxpayer money as a means to manipulate agendas. See, this money... And, and there's not a lot of people that talk about this, but this money doesn't get dispersed evenly on issues. And you still have all these people pretending that grant funding isn't a rigged game. Of course it's rigged. The conclusions are already baked into the parameters of most grants. And so the person that's applying for these grants, for whatever research project they're going to be working on, they know exactly what the government and the bureaucrats want. They know exactly what they want the findings to be. And then they tailor their grant their research to fit the agenda. And they do that so that they could keep the grant funding alive because it's all a scam. That's why. Imagine your career is based on government grants. Are you going to defy the powers that be and come to an opposite conclusion of what they expect? Obviously not, because if you do that, the grant funding spigots are turned off and you're out of a job. That's how grant funding has become such a scam. 
it is becoming increasingly weaponized based on ideology. Do you really believe that you could go out there today and get a grant based on a hypothesis that the climate is changing naturally? Do you really believe the government would approve of such a grant? Of course they wouldn't. Do you think the government and Fauci's NIH will be providing any funding for grants focusing on why just maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't be funding gain-of-function research? Do you think those types of grants are going out? No, of course not. Because it's about an agenda. And it shows that we're not really a free people. The idea that people in the Western world believe they live in free societies is simply wrong. We are not as free as we think we are, and we should stop pretending that we are. Too many have become dependent on the government, whether it's people in the system, corporations receiving subsidies, grant funding, you name it. And this dependency has made us prisoners to the government. The government is a prisoner to itself. How reliant have the state and local governments become on the federal government? And when you rely on government for the outcomes in your life, you are a prisoner to that same government. Relying on yourself, now that's empowerment. That's what it means to be free. For the most part, we the people, especially here in the United States, people are generally good and decent. It doesn't mean that we're perfect or without flaws. I have plenty of flaws. I readily admit that. One day I'll write a book on all of them. But I have to think that the majority of people, they, they want to look and do the right thing. We mind our own business. We, we provide for our families and the ones we love. We want to be left alone. We want to be able to protect our families, raise our children from young boys and girls, and grow them into decent men and women who contribute to society. As Americans, we routinely give to charity. We, even if we're living paycheck to paycheck, we still are very giving. In times of disasters, we come together and help each other out. But something's changed. Something has changed. It used to be that this is what makes us a robust society. But now we see ordinary people coming in a, under attack, all because they believe in the idea of a, a traditional culture, traditional American values, all because they value things like liberty and freedom. And now when you say you disagree with the expansion of government or, or you don't want the government to get involved in a particular issue, you're maligned. And, and they subscribe the worst motives to us, the worst motives to their political opponents. All the while, the government continues to usurp power and authority. And sooner or later, it's going to come back around. It doesn't work well for anyone if we continue down this trend. Anyone who dissents from the narrative is threatened with being labeled a domestic terrorist. That's how far we've gotten. That's how bad it's gotten. And that's how they view anyone who stands in their way of power. And we need to stop this. And we have to stop it now because a nation will not survive if it continues down this path. So I hope you found the content of this episode informative. It's why I ask that you share it with other people. Spread the message out there. Don't forget to give the PAS Report a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Take 30 seconds to write a review. I want to thank you for joining me, and I'll be back on Monday with another great episode of the PAS Report Podcast. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. Podcast. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Also, visit PASReport.com and follow us on Twitter at PASReport. 